Ladies and gentlemen, welcome and thank you for coming. My name is Ben Rogers. I'm a director of the Centre for London, uh, the think tank for London. Uh, if you don't know about us, uh, look us up on our web, uh, follow us on Twitter, sign up for our newsletter. We're just delighted to welcome you here today. Uh, we've got a, a packed evening. I'm only going to say a few words before um, I uh, hand over to Peter Murray, um, chair of the NLA. I'll just make one point of substance, I think, which is that we will hear a lot of people tonight getting it in the neck. Uh, developers will get it in the neck. Architects will get it in the neck. Planners, politicians, conservationists. But I do wonder actually whether the London public should also get it in the neck. Uh, in, so, in so far as it seems to me we've failed to create an effective sort of civic organization in London which can monitor uh, developments in the built environment and contribute to debates uh, about it. And I wonder if we had such uh, an organization, we would have been um, aware of the sort of rapidly changing nature of London skyline and the extraordinary transformation that's coming down the tunnel. But because we don't have that sort of organization, uh, we weren't aware of it. And I think there's a sort of striking contrast, uh, the way in which organizations like the National Trust, for instance, um, guard Britain's uh, countryside, or the way in which in New York there's a number of organizations, civic organizations with a large membership, mass membership, uh, public membership, which again play a role in uh, giving the public, the New York public, a voice in uh, debates about New York's future. I'm thinking particularly of the Municipal Arts Society, which has an annual budget of five and a half million dollars, 8,000 members, newsletter of 25,000 people. There's nothing in London of that nature. I think the fact that you're all here tonight shows us an appetite uh, for, for the creation of those, that sort of civic voice and um, perhaps one of the outcomes of this debate uh, and the whole debate around towers is we'll see the emergence of, uh, as I say, a sort of forum for public debates about the future of London's skyline and London's built environment more generally. Anyway, uh, with that said, I'm going to hand over to Peter, of course, um, was the man who actually got the debate going in the first place um, and deserves huge uh, credit for that. Uh, thank you very much, Ben, and uh, welcome to this keynote event for the London Festival of Architecture, the 10th uh, uh, year of the uh, Festival of Architecture. And, of course, this is a debate associated with the exhibition, uh, which Ben mentioned, London's Growing Up at the NLA. And uh, that's on till June the 12th, if you haven't managed to get to it yet. But it has created huge interest in London and around the world. But I, I welcome you here both as uh, founder director of London Festival of Architecture, also chairman of NLA and curator of the exhibition, but also, and um, I didn't know Ben was going to feed this one to me, but uh, also as chairman of the London Society, the London Society, which was started by Lutyens, Raymond Unwin, Beresford Pite, and many others in 1912, was a key organisation for debating change and infrastructure and new buildings in London, and a group of us are now reviving up to provide just that civic voice for London that Ben was talking about. Uh, we haven't quite got a budget of $5.5 million yet, but hopefully in a few years' time, with the support of all those people who love London, we will have. But uh, that's all from me, and I'm really going to hand over now to uh, Sarah Gaventa, who is going to chair this uh, debate, which, as Ben suggested, I'm sure will be very uh, fascinating and lively. And uh, Sarah is ideally suited to act as chairman. She was uh, former director of Cave Space, currently associate at uh, Roger Sturk Harbour, but from July, she will be design director and curator of the Remarkable Cities programme at Beyond Green but she's also a founding member of London Festival of Architecture and currently chairs the Elephant and Castle Community Forum. So uh, if you would welcome Sarah Gaventa, our chair for this evening. Thank you very much and thank you all for turning out tonight. Um, you can tell that the summer of football hasn't started yet. Um, nor is the summer, has it? Last time I was here was to um, attend a pantomime, so I'm hoping that we get the same level of audience participation tonight. Will I? Yes. Great, thank you very much. Now, um, we have 10 contributions from eight guests, plus the audience. 
Um, so we have a surfeit of riches tonight, um, and it's going to be a bit like herding cats, so please bear with us while we go on and off the stage. Um, this, obviously, event is a response to the um, London's Growing Up study that the NLA have produced, and also Rome War Skyline campaign. Um, one of the things I would say before we start is that um, just to make you aware that this event is being live streamed, whatever that is, on the LSE website and media, and also BBC London are outside doing some filming. I'm not sure why they're not inside. So can we all keep our language clean, our innuendos restrained, and turn our mobiles off? That would be great. Um, before I welcome the first speaker, we're going to be take a very quick and unscientific vote. Um, really just to see whether any of our speakers make any impact on you at all tonight and, 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 and actually can be very persuasive and change how you feel. So first of all, I'd like to ask you to raise your hand if you believe that London needs more tall buildings. Okay. Quite a lot of hands. I would say that's about 60, 70%. Can you raise your hand if you think London doesn't need any more tall buildings? Simon Jenkins didn't even raise his hand then. So, yeah, I think that's about 80-20. That's about so um, I think Simon and Nicholas have got their work cut out for them this evening. So thank you for that. And what we'll do then is then we'll have a, we'll have a show of hands at the end of the evening um, and see uh, whether, one, you're still awake, and two, whether you feel any different. So first of all, how we're going to start off is that we've got four speakers, two for the motion, the proposition, and two for the opposition. Um, and they will come up and talk for five minutes each. Then there will be some respondents, uh, Nikki Gavron, Edward, Les Ed Edward Lister, if he makes it, Rowan Moore and Tony Travis. Um, and then we'll open up to the floor because we're very keen to hear from the audience about your views on the subject. I'd like to introduce the first speaker um, for the motion, for the proposition, and that's Paul Finch, who's the Programme Director of World Architecture Festival. He is the sort of godfather of architectural publishing and the champion of contemporary architecture, and he was formerly the chair of CABE. So, Paul, if you'd like to come up. Uh, Sarah, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Um, well, I propose this motion with some trepidation because if 80% of you think we should have more tall towers, then my contribution can probably only head us in one direction, which is downwards. Uh, we're starting from a winning position, which is always a little bit dangerous. Um, let me say that unlike some of the antis here this evening, um, I actually support the Skyline campaign launched by The Observer and Rowan Moore and uh, The Architects Journal. But I think in a different spirit to some uh, signatories to that ca campaign, who I think see it as a way of opposing tall buildings, which they may dislike or in some cases uh, even hate. Uh, and let's face it, that campaign and the size of this audience and the response to it suggests that this is a sort of hot topic for Londoners, uh, took place on the basis of 200 or more buildings of 20 storeys plus uh, being approved or submitted for planning uh, on the current scene. How many more could you possibly want, uh, one might ask? Well, can I suggest a couple of things? First, and in a sense, I slightly uh, take issue with the campaign on this one, because in London, a building that is 12 storeys high will generally offer you unobstructed views uh, across uh, the city. So there is a question about actually what constitutes tallness. I mean, if 20 stories is tall, how about 19? Uh, should we be thinking about tallness in a slightly different context? That's to say, what's an appropriate tallness for different parts of the capital? Second, just on the numbers, if we built uh, an average of one new tall building per borough per year, that would give us 330 over 10 years, with 200 in the pipeline. Is this unimaginable? Is it completely unacceptable to think that entire London borough, uh, most of which are larger than most provincial cities, is incapable of finding a suitable site for a tall building? I suggest uh, not. But why would we want tall, tall buildings anyway? First, because as a global trading company and a, a country and a city, we need to respond to international markets. One example. The City of London is now the world centre for insurance because we're providing the locations and the buildings that that market requires. When Aon announced that it was moving 
the, t the whole of its top executive team from Chicago, um, guess which building it had chosen to rehouse them in? The cheese grater, the best of the current crop of tall buildings being built in the city. Partly as a consequence of that, another American insurance giant, W.R. Barclay, commissioned their own uh, 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 tower, the so-called scalpel, on a site diagonally opposite uh, the cheese grater. Now, that company operates from a mid-rise in Boston, but in London it wanted a tower, and it's got it, and that's why they're moving here. And as Prince Charles might say, don't spit on your luck. As he would not say, let the market do what it wants if what it wants is good enough. Uh, second, if we're to avoid an inevitable sprawling of London into Greenbelt and the creation of what the critic Dan Sujic has called the 100-mile city, we need to be able to build up, not just out. The unprecedented demand for new housing in the capital requires us to use every potential arrow in our supply quiver, and that includes, I suggest, tall buildings. It's often said that tall buildings are not the answer to housing demand. My proposition is that they are part of the answer and are certainly not mutually exclusive in relation to medium and even low density development. The reasons for the current housing shortage are complex and interrelated but fundamentally stem from a failure to maintain an increased supply. Denying the possibility of, bu of, of building tall will not help that situation. And in response to the further complaint that we're building too many towers for overseas investors who will not live here, my response is that if they wish to invest in London, they will do so anyway. If we don't build, build to help meet that demand, then those investors will buy existing stock, thereby making things even worse. You cannot solve the housing problem by picking on one building type for excoriation. London is a city of radical change in its racial and cultural makeup as much as its built environment. Rather than worrying about alien forms or intrusive interlopers or changed character, do we really want to have architectural policies that sound as though they've been drafted by UKIP? We should be embracing the positive possibilities that a wave of new construction presents, not just providing us with homes and workplaces, but contributing to the improvement of our urban landscape using some of the financial gain that towers generate for public purposes. Support this motion, therefore, as a vote for quality as much as a vote for quantity. We, in fact, have a very good mayoral policy on tall buildings. Uh, for those with an interest in these things, it is section 7.7 .7 of the London Plan, which is as good a policy on high-rise uh, as any city in the world possesses. I say it hasn't entirely been put properly into effect for a variety of reasons, but that's not what we're debating tonight. What we're debating tonight is whether or not we need these tall buildings. I say we do support this motion. Onward and upward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. I'd now like to invite Simon Jenkins, who is chairman of the National Trust, to um, come up and speak for the opposition. Um, Simon was recently described as like John Humphreys, but with constant toothache. Um, he's a man of many talents. He's a journalist and author. He writes for The Guardian, Guardian and The Evening Standard. He used to be chairman of English Heritage. He was knighted for services to journalism in 2004 and has been the chairman of the National Trust since 2008. Among the things that he dislikes, apart from skyscrapers, are also wind turbines, which I think I'm correct in saying. So I should think the Strata Tower and the Elephant Castle is a particularly annoying building for you. May I invite Simon up to the stage? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, some of that was true. Um, uh, I'm always aware when I talk about the subject to architectural, semi-architectural audiences that most of the people I'm talking to are architects, and I'm aware that many are here. To talk about tall buildings to architects is like talking to, or like defending wind turbines to oil executives. Um, architects don't, like turkeys, vote for Christmas. Um, uh, and so I always feel it'd be helpful if it was genuinely the voice of London rather than the voice of a profession uh, that was talking about something that, that, that architects do. Um, all that said, uh, I speak from a, a shameless standpoint of loving London. <clears throat> I've loved it all my life, I've looked at it all my life, um, I've educated myself in it all my life, and I've loved the way in which it's evolved over the, over the years, um, 
the, the enclaves, the feistiness, the, um, the battles we always used to have and still have over conservation. Um, uh, and the particular thing I used to respect was the framework in which it took place, which was a run, an ongoing running debate about what London should look like. Even when we, when we lost the great battles, like over Bishopsgate or wherever, um, we knew why we'd lost. When we won in Covent Garden, when we won at St Pancras, um, we knew why we'd won. There was a language of London that was common to us all. The last 15 years have seen that language collapse. No one ever told us there were going to be 300 over 20-storey buildings in London uh, over the next five, 10 years. No one ever told us what the policy was. Um, we just heard about the, uh, the mayor's plan for London. I I've got it in my head. Uh, the mayor says there should be no buildings tall, tall enough to call unacceptable harm and their impact on London. What is unacceptable harm? What's acceptable harm? Uh, th these words are meaningless. Um, the only policy that the mayor has for tall buildings in London at the moment is his whim. Did he like it or not? Um, there is no document that tells you where they should go. Uh, the policy that used to exist, which was a policy of cluster, and not a policy of pepper potting, as it's called, um, has gone. Uh, the idea that they should be in the, on, on the crown of the city uh, has gone. The walkie-talkies slid down the hill. Um, the, the idea that there should not be a cavern along the Thames has gone. Uh, there is going to be a cavern along the Thames, a canyon along the Thames, uh, if all these buildings go up. There was nothing said in public. Uh, indeed, Boris Johnson promised there would be no more tall buildings at one point. There was nothing said in public that the particular um, outcrop of uh, very tall buildings, or some of them are very tall like the Shard, um, was going to take place in this city. We were never asked. We were just told. And indeed, I have to say, I don't think any of the people responsible thought themselves that they were building 250 new tall buildings in London. They just happened as a result of s secret conversations between one developer, uh, one architect, one politician, somehow or other, each one slides through without it fit fitting into any plan at all. And if, if Eddie Lister turns up, I'd like, him to tell him, I'd like him to tell us when he proposed that there should be as many tall buildings and where they were planned to go at the beginning. This has just happened, and it would not have happened in any other city in Europe. Paris, Berlin, Amsterdam, Milan, Rome, deeply corrupt many of them, managed to get along without having a rash of tall buildings right across their central area. Something has happened in London quite extraordinary. Now, the motion here says uh, we need them. Well, we don't need them. 80% um, uh, of the tall buildings proposed now are for luxury flats. Um, uh, we need luxury flats like, 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 like a plague. Um, the tall buildings in London have almost all gone up with foreign money um, as an investment or a speculative investment. None of them have any civic significance. They aren't raw de poire. They aren't... Um, they aren't the foci of some view. Um, they are utterly random. The, uh, the, the offices are not popular. Um, Gherkin's gone bankrupt. Uh, Canary Wharf went bankrupt at one stage. Um, about a quarter of the towers designed for offices are not occupied. Uh, the Shard is proving difficult to occupy. Office developers do not like these tall, narrow buildings. They like large floor plates, uh, low den high density, low rise. Uh, and indeed, I'm sure that these people who we always boast come to London because of London's office space. They all want to go, we all know, to Berkeley Square, which is where the bosses tend to go while everybody else gets, kick, gets kicked out of London. Um, the issue is not employment. Um, the uh, issue is housing. Uh, London desperately needs more housing, but that housing should be low density, high, ri uh, high, high density, low rise, which is what most people say they want. Uh, most of these flats are being sold, as we all know this, off plan in Malaysia and the Far East. Um, uh, the, the new blocks going up at Battersea Power Station, the developers promised, pledged to the mayor, a sort of desperate gesture of locality. The people who bought them would have to come to London to sign the lease before they went back home. Uh, that's, that's the scale of this. These are not properties that are needed. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is in many ways tragic because they are, they are peculiarly inefficient buildings, as, as, as honest architects will tell you. Um, they're stashed full of lifts and uh, servicing. Um, they don't hit the ground well. Um, they deteriorate quickly. They're very expensive to maintain. Um, a lot of these tall buildings elsewhere in Europe deteriorate quite quickly. Um, they go into multi-occupancy if they're used at all. Um, I do think these are not efficient buildings in London terms. Uh, we've got to build. Um, uh, architects should be encouraged to build high density, high density, low rise, and they should get into architectural magazines for so doing rather than for doing tall buildings. Um, these things are alien. Uh, they're, they're, they're not London. They don't look like London, they look like Dubai. Um, I don't like them, I don't think many people like them, other than architects, and I think actually architects aren't very happy with them anyway, uh, or so many of them tell me. Um, uh, I do think this is a curious period of London history we're going through. 
And in 200 years' time, people will say, what on earth were they doing at the beginning of the 21st century to put up these strange buildings that are now mo mostly unoccupied? Uh, so, uh, um, oppose the motion, please. Uh, vote against tall buildings. Vote for low rise. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. That was eloquently put. Um, before I ask the second speaker for the proposition, Julia Barfield, to come up, um, Simon um, suggested that the whole, most of the audience are architect, consists of architects. Can we, seeing as I want to get your hands going up and down ready for later, could you raise your hand if you're an architect? Okay, okay. Let's try the other way. Raise your hand if you're not an architect. Okay, so I think we're saying most of the audience probably isn't an architect, but maybe 30, 70. I'm, getting get, I'm just getting into the mood for this. That's great. Um, I'd now like to invite Julia Barfield, who's the founder and director of Marks Barfield Architects, to come up to the stage. Julia proves that you don't have to go up to create a London, London land. Let's start again. You don't have to go up to create a London landmark. You can go round, um, as it was... Her and her husband, David Marks, who created the London Eye, and they were the co-founder and director of the London Eye Company that developed and realized the project, which goes to show that if you want architects want to create good architecture, you tend to have to be the developer too. Um, other projects include the wonderful tree top walkway in Kew Gardens, which is tall but not that tall, and she's currently working on a secondary school for children with profound and multiple learning difficulties. And Julia has received an MBE in 2000 for her work on the London Eye. Thank you. Julia. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, across the world, there's a boom in tall buildings. And as we've seen in recent years, that London is not immune. Um, I don't want London to become an atrophied heritage city, but equally, Sorry. Okay, can anyone do <laughs> anyone technical support? <laughs> Just bang it and it'll be fine. Technical support? Somebody? done. <laughs> so, shall I start again? Across the world, there's a boom in torn buildings, and as we've seen in recent years, London is not immune. But I don't want London to become an atrophied heritage city, but equally, I don't want um, the apparent free-for-all that is rightly being highlighted by the Observer and the AJ Skyline campaign. The question is getting the right balance. We clearly need to get better at directing and controlling building in London so that we develop the city's unique character and identity into the 21st century to ensure quality and avoid becoming the world's property bank. But I believe tall buildings have a role to play as part of a mix along, uh, alongside other typologies in intensifying the city and helping to solve the housing, the housing crisis. Part of London's continuing success has always been its ability to embrace change, integrate new with old. And we shouldn't forget that tall buildings are already part of our built heritage. There are 11 listed tall buildings in central London, recognised examples of an integration of tall buildings into the urban fabric. They share a discrete dignity, a coolness, and a forthright and logical use of materials. And they show that tall buildings don't always have to be in clusters. And you'll notice also that none of them has a funny shape or is inspired by Mr Whippy. Our current um, a rather disjointed planning system, however, has shown itself rather um, lax in, in distinguishing between the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> and this happens, this matters, of course, because they're highly visible and therefore need special attention in the planning system. I mean, I see three of these towers um, daily. And um, we need to ensure that only the good ones get built. We need a London-wide strategy. There's no doubt in my mind that 
The shard is beautiful in the way it reflects the changing light of the sky and echoes London's church spires. But we clearly need a pause for thought about how to make the planning system work better for Londoners. The system is a mechanism for creating a balance between social and market forces and between public benefit and private profit. And it seems like that balance might be slightly out at the moment. I want to just show this, which is, I think, a fine example of decent, affordable high-rise living just around the corner from where I live in Stockwell. It has Parker Morris standard duplex homes, a nursery at the base, an adventure playground two minutes away, a park five minutes away, and schools and doctor surgeries and the tube also five minutes away. Designed by George Finch, no relation, um, apparently. <laughs> um, I don't understand why we rely on developers to build the desperately needed affordable housing round the back of their developers through gritted teeth and of poorer quality than the main development. Why doesn't the public sector take the lead as it did when this building was built? And we could do it much better this time with mixed tenures, blind ten uh, tenancies in mansion blocks, garden squares, streets and well-designed tall buildings, whatever's appropriate for the particular site or context. You can't blight the skyline with a beautiful building. Thank you. Thank you, Julia, and I'd like to apologise for our technical difficulties. Um, our final speaker this, ev this evening for the uh, opposition is Nicholas Boy-Smith, who is the director of Create Streets. Nicholas... Is, uh, the Create Streets is like a social, it's a social enterprise which encourages the creation of more urban homes in conventional terrace streets. Um, and it's already had three policy vi victories, including the creation of a £150 million fund in the 2014 budget. Nicholas was previously a director at Lloyd's Banking Group, an author of Reforming Welfare, and he's a regular contributor to Conservative Home, which I thought was a sister publication to Period Living, but turns out to be a conservative blog. Um, and according to his latest article on um, conservative home, high-rise living means crime, stress, delinquency, and social breakdown. And as a Barbican resident, I'm completely stuffed then. Um, uh, I'd like to invite Nicholas to come up to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. In 1940, as the, uh, as the Dornier bombers were nosing their way up the Thames, George Orwell started one of his most thought-provoking books, The Lion and the Unicorn. What he wrote about what he termed the privateness of English life is, is interesting today, in today's debate. All the culture, he wrote, that is most truly native centres around things which are not official. The pub, the back garden, the fireside, the nice cup of tea, the liberty of the individual, the liberty to have a home of your own, to choose your own amusements instead of having them chosen for you by the state. Orwell's ultimate, visceral, socialist sense of England in those dark days of 1940 was of the private virtues of the small suburban villa, the mansion block, or the workers' terraced house. And that illustrates the first of my four main arguments this evening. Most people just, just don't want this future for London. Every single opinion poll shows that the majority, and often the vast majority of people, don't want to live in large buildings, or even actively want some existing ones pulled down. The preference for, for conventional streets cascades clearly down the decades and shouts out at you like the shining from shook foil in every single source that we can find. That's just a sample. Reasons, reasons given vary, um, but all the, as these quotes from a recent uh, YouGov focus group show, that distaste for high-rise living shows the same themes that Orwell wrote about 74 years ago. The lack of freedom, can't go for a walk, feeling part of a machine. My, my second argument is that people are provably happier and do better living in more modest buildings near the ground. In 40 out of 42 peer-reviewed or statistically robust British or international pieces of research, children do better, families are more stable, crime is lower, people are simply happier living nearer the ground and in smaller buildings. Um, the, the main drivers of that in, in the data seems to be that it's harder to bring up children, people behave less sociably, and crime is easier 
in the semi-private, semi-public spaces, skyscrapers and big buildings necessitate. And that is all from surveys uh, that adjust for economic status. We're not comparing the banker and the binman. So who'd be better behaved, I, I leave to your judgment. Um, that's why skyscrapers are not actually socially just. Most people who can afford to choose their primary residence choose streets. Um, people who can't, hang on, what's the wrong one? People who can't, well, they can't. And this is the reason why tower blocks built in Docklands 15 years ago as luxury flats have ended up as homes for the unintentionally homeless. If you are a child in social housing in Britain, you are 16 times more likely than a child in private housing to live on or above the fifth floor. You're, you're not shocked enough. 16 times. It is arguably one of the greatest inequalities in our society today, and we are currently compounding it. Thirdly, and crucially in the context of relative unpopularity and poor social outcomes, we don't need to build skyscrapers to solve the housing crisis. Terrace streets can be incredibly high density. The most highly dwelt parts of this country are parts of Islington, Notting Hill, Pimlico, Earls Court and Maida Vale. Terrace streets of houses and flats are higher density than most post-war estates. On Create Street's mid-range estimates, if we generated, we regenerated, excuse me, all of London's post-war estates as dense streets, we would build 200 to 300,000 more new homes. Savills have an even higher number, over a decade of housing supply on current estimates, all providing the most popular form of housing and before you even talk about other brownfield sites. What is so desperately sad is that our development model in London makes this so hard to do. We are trapped in a vicious circle of public mistrust, limited land supply, ultra-high land values, and the need for 20% returns and a fast payback. These interact with an inappropriate regulatory regime, which makes it much too hard to build spatially and economically efficient terraced houses and medium-rise flats. I'm not sure the Deputy Mayor has arrived yet, but it is absurd. It is Kafkaesque that the forms of house, street, and flat, which sell at a premium, so popular are they with the public, are all but banned in the current rules. Notting Hill, Chelsea, Clerkenwell, what survives of Old Southwark, near impossible to replicate. Um, a German poet said of Isaac Newton that he would see nothing more in a girl's breast than a crooked line, and in her heart, nothing more interesting than its cubic capacity. Well, I fear we've ended up in the same place in London, a system that makes near impossible the high-density streets, streets that define this city and that Sir Simon Jenkins was talking of so eloquently. Change the rules before you ruin the skyline. Finally, sky skyscrapers are not even good long-term economics. And I, as several of you know, for my sins, used to be a banker. Halifax data, researched by Savills and others, shows that the most rational, the most self-interested form of property to own over the last 30 years has looked like this. The most economically irrational property to own over the first, last 30 years looks like this. Big buildings, skyscrapers, can make great money for developers for the specialist contractors who build them, but they cost at least twice as much to run and they only work commercially when consistently high commercial or high-end residential rents justify them. Maybe it'll be different this time. I hope so, but maybe not. The owners of this building have just gone bust and large slices of these two buildings remain empty as we speak. So my point, ladies and gentlemen, is not that skyscrapers cannot be beautiful. It is not that there isn't a place for them, even a significant place for them in London. It is merely that London is too great, too popular, too loved, too desired to need to predicate our global image on a second, much, much larger generation of towers. And a housing policy, ladies and gentlemen, that requires that second generation of towers is playing Russian roulette with London's future. Those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first make mad. We need to wake up. Thank you. Thanks, Nicholas. He looks like, like Nick Clegg. He sounds like Nick Clegg, but he debates a lot better than Nick Clegg, doesn't he? <laughs> right, I'd now like to invite up the four respondents onto the stage. That's Nikki Gavron. Um, uh, Rowan Moore, Tony Travis, and Edward Lister, if he's here. Please come and take a seat. Two seats. 
sticks over here. Where do you want me to sit? Where, anywhere you like. Now, the idea for this session is that each respondent has a few minutes to respond to what obviously the very eloquent proposition and opposition to the motion. I'd first like to ask Nikki Gavran, who's chair of the planning committee of the London Assembly, um, to provide her point of view. Thank you very much, Sarah. Well, I, my position's quite nuanced, I think. Um, first of all, I think um, I know that skyscrapers have a place in London, but it has to be the right place. It has to, they have to make a positive contribution to their setting. They have to be close to public transport. They have to contribute to London's economic, environmental, and, and socially they have to contribute. And if I um, recall um, and go back, um, Ken Livingstone, when he was mayor, um, was famously fond of tall buildings. And he gave permission for about 20, over eight years, since then, um, so far, uh, Boris Johnson has given permission for 200. And I don't think the public really have known this, and certainly some of his advisers have been rather shocked to find this fact out. Now, these tall buildings are very often in opportunity areas. I'm sure when Eddie Lister comes, he's going to explain that. Opportunity areas, um, districts all over London, where we can have more, more development. And in those areas, um, there are planning frameworks. But they're not like, they're not like, they don't have the public consultation um, and the scrutiny that you get for plans or the scrutiny that you get for an individual planning permission. So I would, I would say, you could say, that the stable door has been left open for far too long without proper scrutiny. Now, we do need tougher policies, but I also want to reiterate that we actually, have, we actually have some very comprehensive policies that are not being, at the moment, interpreted and implemented properly. Let's just take heritage, just very briefly. I mean, si Simon talked about it a bit, but I just want to say that um, heritage is really important. Um, Tourism is part of our economy, but the product is our heritage. And we ignore that at our peril. And we're finding that there are policies which are now damaging iconic buildings. And they're dwarfing iconic buildings. And they're ruining many of our vistas, our iconic vistas. And we have a policy about tall, about tall buildings and heritage. But as I said, it's, it's not being carried through. London's communities, the hallmark, one of, one of the hallmarks of London is the distinctiveness of its neighbourhoods. And i just throw out to you, I mean, would you put a skyscraper, for instance, in that great tourist destination, Camden Town? Would you? Another hallmark is the, is the diversity of our communities and the mix of incomes and cultural backgrounds that make up those communities. Now, if you take the residential policies, for instance, it's a central tenet of the London plan. It's absolutely central that London should preserve its mixed and balanced communities. But we know, and we've heard, that 80% of these skyscrapers are, have luxury flats in them. More than 50%, well over 50% of what's coming are going to be residential. But they're bought, they're bought overseas, We've heard that. They're bought overseas and they're invested in by overseas developers and investors who leave them, who leave them often empty, so you get ghost ghettos. They're not, if they do provide affordable housing, it's a derisory amount for rented accommodation and it's almost always off-site. So what you're getting is a, almost a physical manifestation of segregation and you're polarizing our mixed communities. Now, even more importantly, they're taking land which could be used for mixed, mixed um, communities, um, medium density, and people of all ages, all backgrounds, and of different incomes, much more sustainable. So, and if I, if I go on from that and talk about, I've just mentioned two policies and we're very short of time. Perhaps I should talk about what I think our policies ought to be. As I said, we need to toughen them up. 
I don't know, I hope Tony's going to just mention something about learning from other cities, but I think we need a touch of what they do in Vancouver, and we need a dash of what they're doing in Singapore without all the calls of fiat and the dictatorship. But their regulation, <laughs> their regulation is, is, you know, in those two places, is much stronger than we have. And what we need in London are cluster policies, height policies, view management policies, which are kept to, and perhaps even more view management corridors, perhaps, you know, for some of these iconic new future heritage buildings. And we need, we need to have, make sure that we look at the cumulative impact, that we have good environmental policies. I'm sure I could you know, come up with some more, and we all will. But the main point is that there are more policies that need to come out of this. We need much more transparent and accountable planning processes. And we need our politicians to be more transparent and accountable. And I would say that we definitely need a Skyline Commission. And I'll leave that to Rowan. Thank you, Nikki. And on that note, I'd like to hand over to Rowan Moore, who's the architecture critic of The Observer and is behind the Skyline campaign. Um, it was very nice of you, Sarah, to earlier refer to Rowan Moore's Skyline campaign, like Bruce Forsyth's generation game or something. It, it is, of course, more than just me. There's a very impressive wide range of people who have uh, supported us um, and are involved in it. Um, I think what's lying behind all this is, is, is the quite amazing fact that uh, London is projected to have a population of 10 million um, in a future that is um, coming ever closer. In other words, the, the year in which we are going to reach this target is, this is sooner and sooner, according to experts and Evening Standard headlines. Um, and it's, it's a phenomenal transformation of the city, and it's a huge, huge challenge, um, the like of which London has not faced for a very long time, if ever. Um, however, I would say the current sprouting of towers is a sign of our failure so far to truly address that issue. They're not a sign of the solution. They're, they're a sign of the failure. Um, we've talked about people getting it in the neck. I don't want to... Um, anyone to get it in the neck. I think, I think uh, everyone's doing a, a decent, honorable job, but we, we're facing a sort of scale of, of, of issue that, that hasn't arisen before. Um, the, what, what I think, why I say towers are a sign of failure is because what hasn't happened is a really fundamental examination of how seriously we really are going to um, meet these numbers. Um, we have targets of, of at least 42,000 homes a year that are announced of, that we have to build. Um, when developers want to um, get permission for a tower, that's the argument they now use. I mean, developers are very good at using whatever argument works at a given time. Um, it, it has at some point been London is a world city and needs icons. Now the leading argument is there is a housing shortage, there are housing targets, um, if you give permission to some towers, you can knock a few numbers off those targets. However, if you take, um, let's say, St. George's Tower, one of the better known and more conspicuous and uh, less popular of recent towers, um, that has 223 flats in it. Um, and of course, you could get possibly almost as many flats on that site with a considerably lower building. So let's say you get another 50 flats or something, um, or even 100 flats by putting on the extra uh, 20 stories or, or whatever it is. Um, that's an extraordinarily small dent in the 40,000 a year target. Uh, St. George's Tower also took approaching, I think it's approaching 10 years since it was first proposed. Um, that's partly to do with the planning system, you could argue. It's also to do with cycles in the market. It's also to do with the fact that towers are inflexible uh, building types that require a lot of upfront investment to make them happen. So they can only happen when the market is really buoyant. Uh, they're a kind of clumsy way of addressing need. And of course, as everyone keeps saying, um, there's a very, it's a very reasonable to ask whether these flats are really uh, supplying the kind of housing need um, that London has. In another of prominent tower, 
um, not built yet, won Blackfriars, uh, the starting price for studio flats is £1,080,000. I love the 80000 It's like, <laughs> keep out the real riffraff by putting the extra 80000 on us. Um, which, you know, obviously is not really um, terribly useful for, for a lot of people. Um, but I also think um, that... There's a kind of burden of proof on the people who would like to build lots of towers to show that they are a serious solution to London's uh, housing and other needs. Um, if you're having a sort of comprehensive redesign of the city, which is what's happening, I think the people who want that have to, have to show why it's such a great thing. And when, in the course of the, the debate um, that's been going on over the last couple of months, I asked um, press advisors in City Hall if there was any uh, data on how towers were helping to address uh, housing need. Uh, they said there was, there was none. Um, we all know, or it's very well known, that um, you can achieve high density um, without building tall. Barcelona and Paris, much denser cities than London. Um, with many fewer towers, kind of mansion blocks, eight to ten stories, extremely efficient. Uh, of course, it's not so easy to do that in London because most of London is already there. So it's not, you know, there are no easy answers to this, to this challenge, but all the more reason for a really serious effort by all concerned to look for them. Um, I also have to say, um, you know, in, in this, being involved in this campaign, one is always in the position of making the arguments against towers, which then makes people think that you are anti-towers in all circumstances, in all situations. Um, we are not. I am not. I have supported prominent towers in the past as a, as a journalist. Um, London obviously has towers already, as Julia pointed out. It'd be ridiculous to say absolutely no more. Um, but as everyone also says, they should be well designed in the right place, and, and on the whole, they're not. Um, I'll very quickly talk about what might be done in response. Uh, Paul said Section 7.7 .7 of the London Plan is an admirable, is a fantastic policy. He's right, it says all the right things, everything you could possibly want. But he also said uh, that it's not working very well. Well, if a policy is not working very well, then maybe it's not such a great policy. Um, so the, so the main things which I think should happen is a really uh, serious review of the policies we already have um, and uh, leading to improvements to those policies with the support of evidence. Um, that's going to take a while. Meanwhile, applications are being submitted every week. So I support um, Peter Murray's proposal that there should be a Skyline Commission, which is essentially a group that uh, interprets the existing policies um, better than is currently happening. Um, and I also wholeheartedly support Peter's other idea, which is for a digital model of the whole of London so that people can see what is happening. I mean, the technology has existed for 15 years at least for everyone to see what this future London might look like. Mm. But we've never been shown it. Um, I mean, this is Simon's point. Uh, it's, if you read the small print of the London plan, it says some of the things that might happen. But if you redesign something, it's usual to draw what it might look like. Um, all the more important with, a, with such a, a great and important place as London, uh, that hasn't happened. I don't know how policymakers can make policies on that basis, um, and I don't know how Londoners uh, can be reasonably said to be empowered or involved on that basis. Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. I'd now like to hand over to Tony Travis, who's director of LSE London. OK, well, thank you very much. Uh, and I just want to talk for a few minutes about the skyline element of the Towers debate. There are two ways of looking at the, uh, this issue. I know one is to do with the impact of towers on a neighbourhood, on a small area, and the other is the skyline uh, debate. And I want really to talk about that, because, of course, the question of London's skyline is a regular visitor to London public life. And I mean, anybody who goes to Primrose Hill and looks out across the city today 
will note that uh, the policy is not the Parisian policy as viewed from Sacre Coeur. At some level, uh, London skyline is already a jumble. And I want to talk just a moment, for a moment or two, about why it's a jumble, uh, and then emit a slight warning signal to people, and I'm sure one or two might want a, a single voice, one person, or, one, or a, a commission or whatever, to make all these decisions in the future. There's a cause, because, of course, the current skyline attests to many past politicians by many past policies and decision making by <clears throat> politicians. All the decisions pretty well about tall buildings in London, uh, the ones that are there now, were made by politicians, some by prime ministers, some by cabinet ministers, including one or two that have been photographed here this evening, and many by council planning committees, or an ungainly muddle of the three. And there's no question that an array of policies by the Greater London Council, the Whitehall, Greater London Authority, and the boroughs have created today's skyline. So if you ask yourself, how did Senate House get built? A 220-storey building, and nobody's ever been able to explain this to me, 220-storey 1930s, is it? 120. Foot. Foot. Did I say story? <laughs> story. You can see I've been infected by the evening's debate. 220 foot building in uh, Bloomsbury, built at a time when there was a 100, uh, sto 100 foot skyline limit. Tower blocks in the 60s, Harold Wilson subsidised <coughs> hotels, Centre Point, built after all to subsidise a roundabout more than anything else and the Canary Wharf supercluster. All of these decisions were made one by one over time, and many, many others. And I think the difficulty looking ahead is that the current proposals for towers uh, and their locations is that all the decisions will be made by boroughs, the mayor, and the secretary of state. That's the way it's always been done, and that's the way it will continue to be done. And of course, in the current debate, particularly about the South Bank, as viewed from central London, what to central London looks like, and the South Bank looks like part of central London, of course, for the boroughs in South London, it's the far northern edge of their borough, in largely industrial areas that have been not used for very, very many years, and which are now available, and indeed, frankly, from the borough's point of view, an opportunity to derive greater tax revenue. They've been given incentives to do that. So, this begs the question of if there were a commission and if towers were, or the decisions about where to locate towers were made consistently, that would require a central decision-making point, possibly by a committee of experts, but even if it were a committee of experts, it would have to be one which was empowered by politicians who, after all, have the legitimacy to make such a decision. And in the end, that would either mean people appointed by the mayor or the secretary of state seems to me there's no other way of doing this. It would have to be appointed by one of these two creatures, figures, and they, in turn, would then make the decisions. Now, that's why other cities look different, because in most cities, there are not 10 or 12 central London authorities making the decisions. There's one city in New York, one city government, one in Frankfurt, one in Paris. But we've chosen, evolved a system of government that makes the decisions in the way it does. And I think if you did have one decision-making centre, it would probably cluster the buildings, but it doesn't, doesn't mean there'd be fewer of them. I mean, this picture is the result of the city having a view. Now, it's possible if these decisions had all been made by the GLC or by the mayor, it would not have looked like that, but somewhere else might have looked like that, that we didn't, you know, near a Victoria, for example, wherever it would have been. So, uh, if there were to be a single decision-making point, then not only would it risk other parts of London that have so far not had tall buildings, getting lots of them, but of course the boroughs that didn't get them would then have to be compensated by somebody for the income foregone, and it's worth remembering that when we're thinking about why boroughs make the decisions they do now. And now. So what I would simply end by reinforcing is the idea that if there is to be a single decision-making place, we must hope that it makes the decisions that you want, not that somebody else wants. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. And I'll hand over to our final respondent this evening, Edward Lister. Lister, even.
um, who is Deputy Mayor for Policy and Planning at the GLA. Thank you. Um, I find myself with some difficulty this evening because I, I can agree with all the speakers to some extent, but I cannot agree with any of them all of the time. And I suspect that's where most of us probably are. Um, it, it, it isn't full of easy answers, any of this. Um, a lot of this has been established because of history, um, for one reason or another. If you look at, say, Canary Wharf, um, where there are proposed another 20 towers to go up there, is that radically going to change your feeling about Canary Wharf if it had 20 more towers in it? I don't think it particularly is. If somebody said to you, I'm going to start putting all those towers into, into my, my area, you may have a very different view of things. Um, and I think it does depend upon where you are uh, and, and, and what's there already. There is no London vernacular of, of property. It doesn't exist. It's, it's a pipe dream to think that it does. Um, some parts of London are ideally suited to low-rise development and, and, long, and they should continue. And I, I join with everybody else who says you don't really want an odd tower block popping up in the middle of nowhere. But where we have got clusters, and you can make a case for clusters, and clusters make sense, there is no reason why that part of London shouldn't look like that, shouldn't be more different, shouldn't be a bit more of a Manhattan-type feel to a, a Pimlico-type feel. London is full of, of, of different places. We, we've often talked about London having 200 villages. Um, London is that. It's 200 very different places. Some of them can be tall, some of them can be low-lying. It's, it's, it's a mixture of different things. Um, the, the, the guy from Create Streets was absolutely right when he made the point that you can get density, similar densities, out of low-rise buildings. We, we all know that. But you wouldn't necessarily want a uniform pattern of low-rise buildings all over London. Um, you want to see variety. You want to see change. Don't let's kid ourselves. I mean, the Shard, um, after it was built, admittedly, not before, but after it was built, has been voted as one of the most popular buildings in London. So Londoners do actually like tall buildings. Um, they, they're not opposed to them. There is this other myth that tall buildings are full of um, families. Um, that's not the evidence that's coming through at the moment. The evidence coming through is that tall buildings are largely through, uh, are largely full of, of, of couples, um, of singles, um, and by and large families um, are going into lower rise accommodation, and that tends to be the pattern for two reasons. One, Nicky Gavron's absolutely right. The cost of maintenance is so high in a tower block, it is just not practical to often have social housing in one of those tower blocks. So you tend to put it in a neighbouring lower rise block somewhere nearby. Um, and, and so that does tend to be the pattern. Um, now, of course, in the 60s and 70s, we were putting families into those tower blocks, and those families hated it. Um, we're now putting, um, as I say, singles <coughs> and couples into those tower blocks, and they love it. Um, I just think we got the mix wrong when we did it last time, and we've got a mix that's right this time. So my, my contention is tower blocks are absolutely fine, to, are in the right places and in clusters. And we have to be careful about those clusters. We need to make sure that we like the look of the cluster. We've had the example of St George's Tower. Would you really like that to be standing all alone there? Um, um, while well, I would argue to have another tower further in and indeed a cluster of towers there will actually make it all look substantially better than it does today when you cluster a group of towers and you certainly don't want the tallest one right on the edge of the river um, which, which doesn't make a lot of sense so my, my contention is towers in clusters, in height what they look like as a cluster and then above all what they look like as they hit the ground um, because that's that actually is just as important that you, you get the mix. But in other parts of London, I agree completely with the argument about low-rise buildings. I agree with mansion blocks. I agree with all of those things, but we want variety and mixture. And when we talk about these high-rise areas, I mean, we're talking about places like Canary Wharf, Elephant and Castle, Vauxhall Nine Elms. They're the sort of places that are being talked about for those tall buildings, not everywhere. Um, and then the only other thing I wanted to just, just make the point is, is about that 
about the development of the city. Um, we're growing at, at about 100,000 people a year at the present moment. Um, we have this magical moment um, sometime early in 2015 where the population of London will once again be at 8.6 million. And our last time at 8.6 million was in 1939. We will have finally got back to that, that high spot in population terms. But it doesn't stop there. It'll continue to grow at circa 100,000 a year. Um, now that hopefully will drop off, drop off a bit. We will start to see families and other people moving out of London, which is something we haven't seen with the recession. So let's hope it, it drops back towards more like the 75,000 number. But even so, we have got to accept the fact we are a much denser city tomorrow than we have today, and that density will continue to increase. And that therefore means we've got to think very carefully about what we do to different parts of the city. So fine, low rise in some, high rise in the other. Thank you, Eddie. Lister, um, thank, you so, thank you to the audience as well for you've been really um, patient. And so now it's your turn. There will be a couple of people passing amongst you with some microphones. And can I ask that uh, you wait for the microphone and then state who you are before making a point? Um, and if you could make that point uh, short and sweet um, and interesting, that would be great. Um, you might have w worked out there's a bit of a gender imbalance going on here. So um, I'm going to use the chair's prerogative and say I'd like to take some questions or statements from the audience from females first, if that's possible or those that identify with the female gender, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> There's one, look, up there. Microphone, please, to the uh, lady behind the man who's leaving. There we go, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you very much to everybody for their contributions. Um, my question goes back, really, to the title of the debate, which is whether we need more tall buildings. I must admit from the evidence that I've heard brought in front of us this evening that I can't see that we do have evidence that we need more buildings. Um, from what we've discussed so far, um, we've described that there is the need for additional accommodation, but we haven't, um, we haven't described that these tall buildings are necessarily going to meet that. In fact, the evidence that's been brought up before has suggested that only a very small amount of the, uh, of the housing that's provided by tall buildings is actually available for the kind of accommodation that London really needs. Uh, the second point was that people don't seem to want to live in tall buildings, and I haven't seen anybody address the point that Nicholas brought up about the fact that, that, that they're just not desirable as places to live for the vast majority of the population. The third point relates to the business side of things. Um, I think the first speaker mentioned that um, certain businesses, one or two businesses he cited, were interested in moving to tall buildings in the city. But that's anecdotal. Have, do we have any robust, uh, substantial evidence that suggests that businesses want to move only to tall buildings? Or do they just want good quality, well-designed, attractive, interesting architecture? Okay. And the it? final point just oh. simply is... <laughs> that's four, that that's means, enough. And, and that is, is simply financially. We, we've mentioned that boroughs benefit under the current planning policies from, from, from giving, the, giving way to certain of these tall buildings. But we all know that, that there are planning policies that allow for money in certain ways, but, 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 but they often get it back yeah, in other ways from government. So is, is there really evidence that shows that these new tall buildings are bringing in substantial amounts to our community? Anyone on the panel want to respond to any bit? Uh, well, the last point is actually a really important one because um, if you say what would happen if, if London didn't have any tall buildings, um, one, one thing it might possibly arguably lose is, is a source of income from, from planning gain because all developments have to make contributions, uh, high or low, have to make contributions to... Um, uh, affordable housing and infrastructure. <coughs> so um, a major attraction to boroughs like Lambeth and Southwark, as Tony will tell you much better than me, is that um, they, they get a tithe, they get a, they get a lump of money uh, promised 
each time they give permission to, to one of these towers. And given um, the extreme pressures that local financial pressures that local authorities are now under, that's an extremely attractive proposition. But then I think you have to say, well, it is, should, should the city be redesigned due to a, a particular kink in the what is essentially a taxation structure? Um, do we in fact have the right form of property taxation? Um, and, 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 and should we be, be led by that? I think Nikki wants to. Yes, I would just. Well. I mean, you made a number of different points. And I think I mean, one of the issues is that we've. We're really looking at a great many residential, well, they are very tall, you know, 20 to sort of, you know, up to sort of 70, 80, 90 um, floors, stories. So, and we're looking at, you know, what's been, one of the proposals is that these are going to answer London's housing shortage. Now, we've already heard that one of the, the reasons, we know one of the reasons that people support tall buildings, tall residential buildings, which have many, many luxury flats in them, maybe super pricey hotels, is that they're going to give money um, so that we can build affordable rented accommodation, because they very rarely have rented accommodation in them, um, somewhere, you know, not too far away maybe. And I was making the point that that, in a sense, I think, physically makes, um, physically sort of reinforces the segregation point. But there's also, there's also the point that, it's what I was trying to make that point, that they take land. We have 4,000 hectares of land. I think we have a lot of land in London, but we need it. We need every single bit of it. And they're taking land, and it's been even, you know, it is agreed with this. They're taking land that could be used um, for much more mixed community housing, mixed income housing, people from all backgrounds, and people who are actually going to live in them as well. So I just want to make that point. And the amounts... I think, I mean, just take two weeks ago, permission was given for one Nine Elms. Um, this, this is a, you know, it's 53 stories, one tower, I think it's about 43 the other. I might not have got that quite right, but you get the picture in, in Vauxhall Nine Elms. And that's got, um, that's got super pricey hotel, luxury flats, and the hotel is 700 million. The whole development is probably getting on for 2 billion. There's some retail at the bottom, it's mixed use. However, the affordable housing amount is 6.8 million. Now, I just want to leave that there. Okay. Eddie. Uh, OK, can I come in? Because I think, again, I, I, I wanted just to argue some of the myths about this. Um, so, uh, the question that says, is there evidence that people want to live in tall buildings? Well, I'm sorry, there is evidence that people want to live in tall buildings. They pay an awful lot of money to live in tall buildings. Um, so, the evidence is there. There's nothing wrong with nothing wrong with that. Um, I fully accept the argument. You don't want to force families into the, the, that building. I think understand that. Um, the second one, the, the, the point about um, the, the levy, which we've used that word. Um, it's not quite a levy, but there is planning gain. Um, it's it's estimated that in any scheme we're looking for about 30% um, social housing on a 60-40 split. I mean, this is our ideal. 60-40 split, 60% social rented, 40% some kind of intermediate product, you know, buy to um, sort of uh, low-cost home ownership product, part rent, part buy, something of that nature. Um, and the attraction for the intermediate ones is that they, are, they have less effect on the balance sheet than, than social rent does. Um, so that's what we look at. Uh, on those, some of those tall buildings, that doesn't make sense, so it becomes an off-site payment, and then buildings are built elsewhere to provide that. Now, that's true whether it's a low-rise development or a high-rise development. That principle hasn't moved at all. The next point to make, if I may, and I'll use that one Market Towers one because it's been cited because it's a good one. Um, yes, there is a planning permission out there that's been given for a super luxury hotel, five stars plus, um, whatever that is. Um, what, what's of more interest to me is 500 jobs um, which I think is pretty significant, as many of them are also entry-level jobs, um, in, in an area of London that actually needs that kind of work. It also provides business rates, and that's terribly important um, from a City Hall point of view, because we're having to raise substantial sums of money to pay for the Northern Line extension. And the only reason we are getting the kind of densities that we are getting in the Nine Elms, Vauxhall Nine Elms area, is because we are building a railway line. The railway line is costing us north of a billion pounds. Um, and that's not being paid for by government. It is being paid for out of 
um, business rate uplift and um, a, a levy on, 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 on each property, a developer's tax, for want of a better word, um, which is having to pay it. And each scheme, including one market towers, actually provides 15% um, social housing. It just so happens in the latest changes to the building, they're also providing another 6.8 million towards social housing on top of that. Okay, well, but, before I mean, we, get, before we have a big party political point. debate yeah. on um, community, community infrastructure levy, can we have some more questions from the audience? There's a gentleman here. Oh. oh, hi. Lady there. I'm not sure this thing's on. Can you hear? Okay. Um, one of the, well, the bottom line reason for a high rise getting permission when it doesn't offer any social or economic value is basically the developer's bottom line. And the financial appraisal is not in the public domain. Um, so the justification for a high rise always rests with the developer's balance sheet. Should that not be in the public domain? Uh, well, I mean, the viability assessment which is done um, is, is always done by the developer and is then checked by the local authority. And it's fairly regular for the local authority to get their own viability assessment done to, to check those numbers. Um, so it, it, it is part of the planning process and it is tested um, within the planning process. I, I just Thank want to... Uh, can I just say that the government... Very quickly. The government has recently changed the definition of viability so it now reads as competitive returns to developers and, and investors and landlords, which um, is making, is, you know, which is why, in fact, the returns are going mainly to them and not, in my view, to the needs of London. The gentleman in the tweed. Yeah. I, I find it a bit disturbing in the LSE of all places we're hearing so much xenophobic demonization of Chinese, Malaysian, wherever they are, savers who want to invest in London in properties that are then let out to Londoners. And given these properties can contribute to addressing our, our, our house, the dire housing need in London, I think it worries me that we've had so many speakers and not one of them has said maybe the problem we should be worried about is why haven't we got 460 new towers going up rather than maybe we should kill some of these 230? There you go. Anyone want to respond um, to that yeah, right, I mean, very I, quickly? I, I agree with the kind of ukip like, we That's don't want this dirty foreign money kind of line of argument. You mean you don't I agree think, with it? No. No. You don't agree with it? I didn't. The point, the point, the point, about, a point about investors, whether they're foreign or not, is that these, these are not, if, you, if, if buildings are built as an investment rather than as homes, they tend to have a different uh, quality to their design. They're thought about in a different way. Um, if, you're, if you're buying something as an as a investment product, you have a different mentality towards it um, than if you're buying something as a home. And you can actually see that in the physical consequences. It doesn't matter if the investor is Russian or Chinese or, or British, uh, that's that's the issue. That's why it's that's why it's raised, not because they're foreign. Mm. Okay, can we have um, another speaker, please? There's one gentleman down here in the middle. Um, I think you need to get around with your mics a bit faster, please. Sorry. Because <laughs> oh, I need to go to the pub in about half an hour. I don't know about you. There we go. Thank you. Sorry, my name's Frank Vickery. I've worked on social housing for 40 years in East London. Good for you. And in areas that have grown dramatically because of higher density, high rise blocks. In particular, Poplar, which actually was 85% social housing in the last 10 years because of the Poplar Housing and Regeneration Company, which is a regeneration company that does community work as well. The area has changed because of the introduction of higher density, high rise blocks into the area they already had one, um, which you saw in the pictures earlier. But the crucial issue is the investment coming in for the development was part of our overall housing regeneration package. It wasn't seen as isolated blocks. It created new development on things like two-storey bedsit blocks, which were completely undesirable, putting 20-storey blocks next to Langdon Park. That was created, the link to affordable housing has to be made. 
And the way to do that is the overall delivery in a, in a form of master planning mm. that can be measured, like a business plan for an area. Individual sites can never be done like that. Good point. Uh, Tony, would you be interested in responding to well, that? All I, I mean, the point's been well made. All this, the whole of this discussion tonight, whether about towers or about other big developments, but certainly in relation to towers, is intimately linked with the things they pay for, one way or another. And the state, and I mean the state broadly, not just uh, London's government, is undoubtedly using developments in all sorts of different ways to lever in money, money for new housing developments, money, as Ed Lister said, for tube lines. And the reason that some of these sites, forget whether they're tall or not, looked very densely developed is because they're trying to pay for so much with the development. You know, the government could pay for the re rebuilding of Battersea Power Station, but it won't, and therefore the developer has to pay for it. And that's why, forget tall building for a moment, sites can look overdeveloped as well. And it's all tied in, and what I said about Centrepoint, that was... A, you know, Centrepoint was built largely to fund a roundabout and a gyratory at uh, St Giles. In the end, government tries to milk projects in London to capitalise on rising land values. And that's, you know, inevitably what's going on with a lot of these developments. OK, the lady there. Oh, good evening. Um, Jane Duncan, I'm an architect and I love a beautiful building as much as the next person. Um, but my concern is really very much longer term. What I would like to know from the panel is whether they think that what they're talking about now will give us a good legacy. Mm -hmm. Because in 100 years from now, what we do in this period of change is going to resonate. And I think what we're talking about now are very short-term, perhaps political views. We need to be looking at the longer term. What is London going to be like for the future people that live in it? We're just the custodians in the short term. OK, I think we can leave that as a, a good comment. Another speaker, um, another question. Over here, this... Lady with a baseball cap. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's been long term. Those of us who remember the high rise for the <coughs> Ministry of Health that loomed over Parliament was the first one that really caused major troubles. Then there was Centrepoint. And then there were the, the high rise blocks in Euston Road. And then there was Ware Travelstead in Canary Wharf. Well, we managed to get Canary Wharf moved over out of the view line to St. Anne's on the Isle of Dogs from Greenwich Naval, at that time, the Naval College. And that was a great success. But what nobody knew was at the same time that the, where Travelstead and the others went bankrupt, that they'd already got planning consent for other tall blocks around Canary Wharf. So hence the growth of Canary Wharf on those particular platforms the foundations were put in almost immediately after that success. Um, what worries me very much is that, yes, you've mentioned population growth, you've mentioned economic growth, but you don't seem to have twinned the two. And what um, Nikki Gavron will recall, because she chaired it, the greater, the London, uh, the prior, the, 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 sorry, I'm forgetting the name now, the, um, Planning who, Advisory Committee. That's right, which I attended as a member of the community for 10 years. Um, the decision of the last report that they did was that London should contain its own growth. But subsequently, with the movement of populations from Africa and Asia and, and all around, um, that hasn't been possible unless you looked at it from the point of view of one population substituting for another. And in that particular case, we know that the population movement out of the country is called um, um, net growth um, when it's compared with, with um, gross growth, which is that you get twice as many in as you've got going out. So although London is supposed to be taking that population growth itself, um, and I did an exhibition for the British Council in 1965, which showed that, that um, Thamesmead growth was the equivalent of what was happening in London at that time. What you have the equivalent of now, and I'm sure you all know this better, much better than I do, is about 10 times um, Thamesmead, and there isn't the land to put it. 
Okay, Nikki can we, can we, there is can, we, can, we can we let Nikki respond? Would that be all right? It's just my, that we my, good. May I just finish that point, Chair? Um, Nikki said there is land, but there are other needs on that land. There's the need for green space, for nature, for the growth of, as Silent Spring told us, that we couldn't go on building in the way we were building. And this is not just on the land in the countryside, but also in the cities. And I okay. think that has to be part of your advice and considerations this evening. Okay, thank you very much for that. Nikki, did you want to respond Well, just, I mean, I think London can, I mean, I, I said there's 4,000 hectares. I mean, that's, a hectare is like two, two football pitches. It's pretty big. 4,000 of those um, all, over, you know, all over London and in big sites. And I think we can if we, if we sensitively go for not super density, not skyscrapers so much, as what we've been talking about, which is mansion blocks, which is um, some, in some cases some tower blocks, we can contain um, our population. But the rest of the southeast has to play its part. Okay. And recently, we haven't had the housing in the southeast. Right. I, I think we need to hear more voices from the public. So what may I'm going to ask is that you'll, you, I, I can see at least three mics. So at the top, then there, and then there, um, um, short and sweet. Please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mark Bacon. I live in a Victorian sherry warehouse in Crucifix Lane off Druid Street at the top of Bermondsey Street. A lot of uh, heritage there. Um, there was talk about cluster. Um, there are only, to, to my mind, only two notable clusters in the, the City of London and Canary Wharf. Those are the two clusters. Uh, there was also talk about the fact that clusters are sometimes given less scrutiny than individual buildings. The Shard, which is a magnificent building, stands in splendid isolation. It was approved by the planning committee in splendid isolation, but it's now being used as a pretext to create the third cluster in London by the uh, London Borough of Southwark, and that cluster will be surrounding uh, the Shard. So the Shard will look very much like the City of London in the future. I don't think that's a good idea, and I'd like the panel's opinion on that. Okay, can I take a couple more, and then we'll go to the panel. This gentleman yeah, has been very patient in front. This is sort of picking up a point related to that one, it's related to things Tony said. I remember going to a meeting where the Corporation of London was saying they had to build lots more high buildings in the centre of the city to compete with Canary Wharf. And you think, you know, what sort of bonkers system involves one quite prosperous bit of the, the, the city competing against another prosperous bit of the city? I also wanted to pick up a couple of points that Edward made. One was, if I took right what you said about St. George's Tower, what you're saying is you ought to build a really rubbish building first and then you can get a cluster around it to hide it. <laughs> and uh, the, the second was saying you need to build large buildings to pay for the northern line. You're only building the northern line to, to, to generate the large buildings. That's completely circular. Okay, well put. The gentleman in the corner. Um, my name is Stephen Cloud, I'm a transport planner. Um, I'd like to say something. Uh, the, in the introduction, the speaker said we had no uh, civic voice. Uh, that's very unfair on the London Forum, which does an mm. excellent job. It's true. I don't think we've ever managed to market ourselves. When I say we, I'm not really in it any longer. Um, in the way that they have in New York, and got a mass meeting and a big budget. But they are terribly hardworking and terribly professional and do a very good job. Um, architects. It's a terribly fashion-prone profession. In the 50s and 60s, they all wanted to be like Corbusier, and so we built these tower blocks. And now we're told that there's a worldwide boom in high-rise uh, buildings, so London has to be part of it, el else it becomes some sort of heritage museum. Uh, it's, it's complete rubbish. But there are some very good architects. The whole argument, I'm glad to see various people have made it tonight, that we, you can have high-density with low rise, uh, was put forward and uh, illustrated and proved by architects. I'd like to particularly mention Harley Sherlock, an Eastern architect, who many of you will know, who died about two weeks ago, but was always banging on about this and practiced it too. Um, and far, lastly, uh, you can have variety with high density, low rise. You don't, variety doesn't mean you have to mix high and low. Okay, thank you. Is that Lee Mallet I can see up there with his hand up? Okay. He's my neighbour. If I don't um, let him speak, I'll be in big trouble. I apologise to all those who have been uh, usurped by me grabbing the mic. Lee Mallet. Um, towers ha have been, become popular with the market because of shortage of supply. How come, over the last 10 years, we've seen the population of London rise by 100,000 a year? How come politicians, and this is directed, of course, to Nicky and Eddie, 
why, why haven't politicians released more land and dealt with the shortage of supply, which has been completely obvious to everybody else? Isn't this a political failure in London to address very evident shortage of supply? Well, ready. I mean, I, 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 I think it's um, a failure of, um, of both um, of government at the mayoralty level and at the national level because we haven't addressed the housing crisis. Um, I don't know how long you want me to go on for, but there, uh, I mean, there's been a finance commission, which in fact, Eddie and the mayor actually backed to come up with suggestions. But the key thing is, the mayor has an enormous amount of land. There's a lot of land banking. There, there are about 177,000 homes on large-ish sites that still haven't been released, although they've got planning permission. They're not being built. So, the boroughs aren't allowed to, they need their borrowing caps raised so they can build more. There are a whole range of solutions which should have been, um, really should have been attempted and, you know, and realised over the last few years as the crisis has got worse and worse. But there hasn't been that action. Okay, Eddie, you wanted to quickly say something? Yeah, yes, could I? Just on uh, two points. Firstly, I would defend myself about the, the Roxwell Nine Elms one, if, if you don't mind. Um, what, I was, what I was saying was one isolated tower block on its own doesn't, um, it doesn't fit the bill, in my view. Uh, it is about a cluster. I think to have the cluster moving back from there um, actually works and works well, and the drawings, if you look at them, of the, the way the cluster would develop are quite impressive. Second point, um, yes, it is a circular argument. Um, we are looking for more density, and because we want more density, you've got to have more transport and so on. Um, absolutely right. Um, but we do need the density, and we can't get away from it. We need the density in this city. We are building, at the moment, on average, every year, and we have done, since the, um, the early 30s, about 25,000 to 30,000 housing units a year. And that's been constant. It hasn't really varied. And it, what happened, of course, in the 30s, which is something I know you all fully support, uh, was we actually got up to 80,000 a year. And we got up to 80,000 a year for two reasons. One, we didn't bother with anything called planning, and we had no planning. And secondly, we built all over the Green Belt and we built Metroland. Um, and that's exactly what took place. It didn't do a bad job of it either, actually. Um, but the point is, that was what took place then. Since then, we've had this constant building programme. We've got to double that. We've got to be building circa 50,000 units a year, or we are not going to stand any chance at all of meeting our housing needs in this city. So that means more density. We do have the land available to us. The London plan clearly identifies that we can identify, and we've done this with the boroughs, 42,000 housing units a year can be identified today for the next 10 years, and that exists out there. So the land is there. Um, we need more, and there is more land to get on top of that. But the, what I'm trying to say is land is available. Public land, um, most of the public land is actually held by local authorities. Um, they're the biggest owner of land. They're the biggest um, landlords in the country. Um, and they are themselves have got to release some of that, and that's about intensification of, of some of okay. their sites. Um, the uh, tower that Eddie was referring to is the one that looks like a nose hair trimmer, if you are. Uh... The gentleman, the well-dressed gentleman in row B. Uh, 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 my name's Del Brenner from Regents Network and uh, a member of the Mayor's London Waterways Commission. Two uh, issues, one uh, environment and one uh, Londoners. Uh, Londoners first, uh, it's all very well to talk about uh, ultra-luxury uh, tower blocks for, that uh, people can't afford, but uh, it, it produces thousands of jobs where are these people who are doing these jobs, where do they live? They can't live anywhere near. They're being gradually pushed further and further and further out of London. Another point I'd like to make is the environment. Uh, Nicky Gavron says that uh, the, the buildings are taking place of, uh, of, of other, other things in, in the area, such as green space and so on. It's not only taking place of that, it's taking away other space that's already there, such as uh, the parks and particularly, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the waterways. There's a frenzy of development around the waterways by property developers. Uh, I call that the greed element because, in fact, they make a good 20 or 25% uplift on their developments. But, the, but the, 
take away from the waterway, but they certainly don't contribute anything to the waterways, and I'm afraid the Thames in certain sections has been ruined, and the same on the, ca on the canals, which, with tall buildings around, being a smaller waterway, uh, uh, suffer even more. And uh, it's a very distressing situation that, that's developing rather fast. Okay, thank you for that comment. There was a gentleman who just had the mic there in the middle. Um, uh, Alex Chan, um, is the answer to this conundrum not in the slightly more mundane territory of tax reform? Uh, we've had window taxes in the past which weren't very popular. Maybe we should have a tall building tax which increases with the height of the development. And on a slightly less sort of jocular note, at the moment, under the council tax regime, uh, once your property hits a certain value, it doesn't matter whether it's worth a million or 15 million, 20 million. So if we had some mechanism for the owners of these properties to pay more tax on an ongoing basis, it might make them think twice before they bought them as investment assets or indeed left them empty. Okay, can you move that mic over to that side? There's some people there and the lady in the front row. Thank you very much, Patricia Brown. Um, given that a lot of the comments have actually been directed towards the aesthetics of the buildings, the tall buildings, regardless of the viability and the rationale, etc., it has been making judgments about various styles of architecture. And this is the London Festival of Architecture. And we've got some of the best architects in the world living and working here. What can we do to get a better quality? Can I, can I just add on the same note? As the lady just pointed out the best architects in the London area, which I totally agree that we've got the best British architects in the world. Uh, I just wanted to make a point on tall buildings, and we got more residential developments coming up as tall buildings. And I disagree with it. We need more policies, because we've got, got enough policies. We've got London plan, local policies, and townscape views assessment to do all that. But I think we need one policy, which is fundamental policy, that uh, British developments invested by foreign investors, which is welcomed, but then the housing are sold to British people, the local London people, that there should be a policy which percentage of the housing should be sold to local residents who are renting, but they can buy in tall buildings. Okay. Um, Rowan, would you like to respond to either of those comments? Um, just, just an interesting aside, and I'm not an expert on this, but I believe that one of the reasons why people in Singapore are so keen to invest in London property is because the Singapore uh, <coughs> taxation system is very heavily designed to stop people investing speculatively in property in Singapore. <laughs> but um, I'm in the LSE, and I've possibly said something that's completely untrue. Um, I'd like to pick up something that was said a while ago, which is the fact that um, these buildings will be here for a long time. Um, and... Um, they'll be very visible for a long time, and how will they age? And I think that's a very serious consideration. I think, it, on the one hand, it, it raises the bar for the design quality. Um, if they are going to be so visible for so long, they'd be better be really good, and I don't think they are. And, and we do have the architects in, in the city who, who can do good buildings. Um, but also, you're talking about, and Simon Silver, property developer, um, head screwed on, knows what he's talking about, has made this point. Um, he said, what you've got here is residential towers in which each flat is sold uh, on a long lease. Um, anybody who lives in, in a, even quite a small block where you have multiple leaseholders and you have to repaint the front door or mend the lift or anything like that, you know what a nightmare it is. You've got these buildings with cladding packages which um, probably have warranties for 20 years or so, but we certainly start looking pretty shoddy well before that. Um, we really need to think about what is going to happen when that cladding needs to be replaced and when the freeholder of the building, whoever that might be in the distant future, has to corral all those different people to pay for the recladding. And um, I actually think a rather good idea would be for anybody who wants to build a tower to put forward a serious 50-year, 100-year plan for how actually it is going to be maintained in the future. Because I think that's a, well, what we're seeing, a very short-term um, uh, developments being, being built. Tony, I know you want to jump well, in there. Well, I mean, on the tax issue, I mean, there's no doubt that um, difficulty in terms of trying to restrict 
uh, house buying only to, I'm not saying it would be quite suggestive, but there's an element of this, and it's conflated with the towers debate, but trying to restrict who buys flats in London is that it's complicated by the fact that other aspects of what we do is endlessly to encourage overseas investment in London. So trying to so as say, well, we want you to invest in London but not in housing is a complicated message, I think, which does lead us to the tax question. There's no question that tax, property tax, domestic property tax in London, and indeed in the whole of the this country, is completely shot. It's hopeless. Mm. And the whole system needs reforming. However, no national politician of any party has been willing to touch it, which, we, which has meant we've ended up with random incursions like stamp duty and now the discussion of a mansion tax, none of which would be the solution. And there's no question that if property were taxed rationally and there were a sensible system, it would send out better signals than the weird ones that are sent out today. Thank you. There's a very patient gentleman there. Hi, uh, Rory Meakin. Um, firstly, um, I'd just like to say that um, I think Edward Lister has um, made some brilliant points. And secondly, I have a question, and that is... <laughs> Are you related to him in any way, or I'm not, work for I'm, him? I'm, I'm, I'm not, no. Um, secondly, my, my question is, if, as we've heard a lot, low and medium density apparently can be... Uh, high, rise, rather, can be higher density than uh, tower blocks. If that's so, why is um, Manhattan, why does Manhattan have such a greater density than uh, Paris, let alone Kensington and Chelsea or Islington? Okay, let's just take a couple of last comments because I know um, that Simon and Paul are probably gagging to actually uh, uh, finish off the evening with their rebuttals. So, uh, lady over there in turquoise. Um, hi, um, Angela Brady. Oh, it's Angela, hello. Hi. Um, I think that um, all of this debate really is about the people. It's about people and London and what makes London special. And that's its diversity. And what we've got to be very careful with these huge changes with potential 300 tower blocks. Will, they, will that keep the diversity of London? Or will we become like Paris, that it's a very central and very expensive centre, and that everybody else that services this expensive centre has got to live on the outskirts or the donut effect? And I think that whatever we build has got to be top quality. So I think that a way forward would be that we do need the Skyline Commission. We need it very badly, and we need it to be made up of people like the people in the room here, that it doesn't have a political slant on it. We need to maintain the diversity of the people that make up London. That is what we're famous for. And I worry that we might actually lose this. OK. Uh, do you know, I think... Thank you. Um, I think that might be a nice way to sort of round off that section. Um, I'd like to ask the panel to stay seated while we ask, firstly, Paul Finch to come up and for five minutes give a rebuttal for the proposition, and then followed by Simon Jenkins for a rebuttal for the opposition. And then you can vote. So get those hands all ready and exercise. Well, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I feel considerably more encouraged about the need and the future for tall buildings, having listened to the contributions so far. As you will have noticed, um, crazed overseas investors anxious to lose money go around creating these tall buildings that nobody wants to live in and can't be let to anybody. I say, this is a fantasy. Um, if you want to know what a market is in the rep for residential, our Savills. Uh, if you want to know whether people want to occupy office buildings in the middle of city, the city of London, uh, ask Jones Lang LaSalle or CBRE Richard Ellis or any of those people and they'll tell you because they know what the markets are. And frankly, people making observations from the floor saying, well, no one wants to live in them. Really? Go and check out the queue every time a flat becomes available at the Barbican. I mean, this is a kind of fantasy like the fantasy there are only two clusters. What about Croydon? I mean, the things that get said about tall buildings are so peculiar. So the next thing is, tall buildings cause crime. Well, forgive me for bringing it up, but I uh, was under the impression that the Cray twins were brought up in immaculate low-rise <laughs> terrace housing in Hackney and it didn't stop them nailing their opponents to the floorboards which shows the virtues of traditional construction um, 
OK, the investors take their chances. And because some slightly uh, sort of tax reform Germans came a cropper uh, at the Gherkin, doesn't mean that all the other investors in tall buildings are idiots. Uh, on the contrary. And by the way, Swiss Re uh, made a lot of money out of the Gherkin, mainly through the publicity it got them worldwide for the, from this extraordinary uh, structure. Now, you've heard this evening that diversity of people is great, but we don't want 300 towers because they'll all be the same. They will not all be the same. And, there, and you can look at the images that we've seen all evening of the City of London, which, by the way, an image that only a pigeon will get, you'll never get it which is another point about tall buildings. No one ever wants to tell the truth about the skyline, which is that people see it in different ways. They see it because they move about the city. The condition of the city is one of movement. And if you don't like a view, you can look at something else, quite apart from the fact that other than architects and architecture students, very few people go around gazing up in the air for fear of what they might tread in or who they might bump into. And talking of bumping into people, uh, much of this evening's discussion has really been a cry of pain about the housing market, and I absolutely agree. Uh, I feel your pain. But that's not the same thing as an argument about whether we need tall buildings or not. Uh, the fact that politicians have failed since the early 1980s to manage a decent public housing scheme, because Tories never liked the working class anyway, uh, a new Labour were just embarrassed by them, is the reason that you've heard no real explanation this evening for whether it's tall buildings or short buildings, they have any idea whatsoever about how they're going to cope with the fantastic demands being made on this city in, in the years to come. The best thing I've heard is the mayor, Mayor's idea about intensification, taking existing areas and actually getting more people into existing urban environments. I've got news for you, there's only one way you're going to be able to do that. Either start adding extensions on, as of right, so you take two-storey streets and say, if the street's wide enough, you can go up to four without asking anybody. Or alternatively, you start inserting taller buildings, which I would say is 12 storeys upwards, into existing urban conditions on tiny sites, because that does give you more density. And the truth about density is it's where you draw the line. And as a final plea and as a final comment on the kind of, uh, I would say, the political indolence about these issues. The reason that the Mayor's excellent uh, tall buildings policy hasn't worked is because it requires all the London boroughs to identify, draw lines, if you wish, around those sites and areas that should be capable of taking tall buildings and those which shouldn't. Until, in a sense, we have a more dirigiste attitude where the lines have to be drawn and you start getting zones where the developers know they can build tall at that point, you can then insert your controls on quality. Until that time, you don't know if you can, you don't know if you can't, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. But that is not the fault of tall buildings. They are not the solution to anything, but they are part, I suggest, of a solution, and you should support the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Over to Simon Jenkins. Thank you very much, Chairman. I obviously made a mistake when I spoke before. Uh, I was addressing the motion. Um, uh, I was asked, uh, do we need uh, these tall buildings? I've heard nothing this evening that suggests we need them. Lots of people want them. Quite a lot of people like them. I quite like them. I, I think the, the, the city cluster there is an exciting cluster. And yet I go so far as to say it's one of the best clusters of skyscrapers I've seen. I think the funky, feisty, um, shapeless Mr. Blobby bits of the city corporation um, uh, is more attractive than Manhattan. Um, uh, it's, it's sort of London. I like it, OK? Um, I don't think we ever needed it. Um, it was indeed allowed to happen because the city was absolutely terrified by Canary Wharf. But there's no doubt about that. Um, it, 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 was a, it was a competitive struggle. I think it was sad because the result was growth was dumped down in Canary Wharf and the bits between the city and Canary Wharf were left to ossify. I think it would have been nice if wealth had spread east from the city um, rather than leap over uh, uh, Wapping and Shadow and so on uh, and be dumped down in Poplar where we lost the battle uh, to make Canary Wharf integrated into Poplar. Indeed, it was built as a, as a fortified community which could not be reached from Poplar. One of the most obscene city developments I've ever seen, frankly. Um, was it needed? I don't know. Uh, commercial rents in London have been static for about 20 years. 
Um, the best place to, uh, to have an office development in London now is in a Georgian house in Mayfair. That is where the big money for offices now is. Uh, if there's a need for something, it's for more Georgian houses in Mayfair. We should be building more of them. Uh, we don't need these bloody things. Uh, they may be nice, and architects may like to build them. Fine. That wasn't the motion. Um, the bone of this is really residential. It's, it's, uh, London is getting bigger. Uh, yes, it's getting bigger by 100,000 a year at the moment. Um, it is crazy to think it'll go on doing that. Uh, London's population was declining for quite a period after the war. Um, uh, it was last at its present level in 1932, uh, Eddie tells us. Um, where did they live then? There was no high rise then. Um, the answer is they lived, they lived high density and low rise in awful conditions. But those awful conditions have a remarkable ability when the middle class move into suddenly become extremely expensive. Um, there's all kinds of things you can do with London property. It's a very, very exciting place to study property. The one thing it doesn't need is to go high. Now, um, uh, I totally agree. I love the fact that London is very popular to international money. I'm proud of the fact that my city is so attractive. Um, I still believe it's attractive because many of us fought to keep it attractive against the sorts of pressures that we're now experiencing. Um, uh, I, I honestly think it would be nice if someone wants to recognise the conservation movement's part in making London such a bloody rich place. Um, the people who did that um, are, are, are the people who are now trying to do something sane, as far as I'm concerned, about high-rise. Um, but the, the, the truth of the matter is, most of these towers are speculative residential developments. Yes, uh, uh, they are presumably intended for someone to live in. Uh, I have an uncomfortable habit of wandering around at weekends trying to find lights on in these modern towers. You don't see many. You don't see many lights on in Barbican in the weekend, I'm afraid. Most of these properties are people's second homes in some sense or another, or their first homes with a second home elsewhere. Um, they are not what I call needed housing. One of the reasons why they're so profitable is they're untaxed. The, the, the tax regime in London, as Tony was saying, is, is crazy. Um, any uh, advisor will tell any investor abroad, whatever you do, put your money in London property. No one will touch you there. It's the ultimate tax haven. It's the Cayman Islands on the Thames. And, and, the, and the, the, the present situation in which our property taxes are the lowest in the world, um, our regulation of these buildings is crazy. You can't do that in Berlin. You cannot walk in and invest in a property and leave it empty in Berlin anymore. In New York, someone asked about New York. In New York, these big these big Park Avenue um, uh, uh, properties there, they're run by co-ops. Um, you go in there and you promise to stay there, and if you don't stay there, you're kicked out. I mean, they make sure these places become communities. We have no sense of community in these tall buildings in London. They are tall, um, sky-high investments for people to park their money tax-free until they find a better place to park it later. And my worry is not uh, us going on building these towers, it's what happens when people do desert them. Uh, they're going to become uh, they go sky high slums. They're very expensive to maintain, as, 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 as I think Tony said, or Rowan said. Um, it's difficult to see how they slot into the long term demand for housing in London. Um, yes, singles quite like them. Uh, you, you've seen some of these high rises doing very well. But on the whole, they're not popular places to live. Um, they're for a migratory, transient population, and they don't produce what we like to see in cities, which is a sense of community. Um, all I'm saying is uh, we can do London very well without skyscrapers. We don't need them. You may like them, I may not, but we don't need them. Oppose the motion. Thank you. I shall, of course, be inviting Simon Jenkins to the Barbican Residence Summer Party very soon. <laughs> Your parents used to live there, though, didn't they? Yeah. Well, I think there's something Freudian going on. Um, the moment of truth, guys and ladies. Uh, it's time for the second vote. You've had a, heard a lot from a lot of people this evening, lots of eloquence on the stage. Um, let's see whether this has changed your view. So for those of you who believe that London needs more skyscrapers, could you please, or tall buildings, whatever you want to call them, would you please raise your hand? Oh my gosh. And bring them down again. Those that think London has enough already, or too many. Okay. Simon and Nicholas, I think you did your job. I think it's now closer, more 60-40. Well done. You should think about career in politics, definitely. <laughs> And on that note, um, I'd like to wrap up this evening and thank you all very much for your patience. I'm going to hand over to Tony Travis. I suppose the comment that I would probably leave you with is that um, we do seem a bit divided, um, and that's whether we decide that we like 
um, tall buildings is based on the health of the economy, civic pride, is it about egos, or are we destroying the historic cityscape? But at the end of the day, um, I think it's all about quality, and that seems to be one of the key things that came over. Um, and when it comes to tall buildings, it's not height that matters, it's what you do with it that counts. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a few minutes more, really. I'd just like to um, thank everybody who's taken part in this evening's event. I'd like to thank you on behalf of the LSE uh, and, indeed, my colleagues at LSE London. Uh, the school is committed to hosting and allowing these kind of events to take place, part of our civic role in London. So thank you all for coming. I also should thank the Centre for London, New London Architecture, and the London Festival of, Arch London Festival of Architecture for their enormous logistical support in creating this event this evening. All the work was theirs. I agree with what Ben Rogers said at the beginning, really, about the importance of having a forum to debate events and matters of this kind. Uh, it is easy in a city the scale of London to imagine it's impossible to have a debate about elements of its future, but it isn't. It is easily possible to bring people together. It happens from time to time. And when it does, undoubtedly, it produces a range of ideas. It can change opinions, as we've seen. And this is surely a good thing. So I think we can take some uh, comfort from the fact that it is possible to have a debate about controversial issues in this city and to advance understanding. I suspect there will be more towers. The great thing about London is it does always inch forward towers here, no towers there. It will continue to be like that. It is a flexible and extraordinary, slightly muddled but brilliantly creative place. And some of them will be better planned, some of them will be better looking, and some of them won't. So thank you for coming. I'd like to thank our chair, Sarah, by the way, because in case nobody else does. and encourage both sides, because it was sides tonight, to fight on for London's improvement. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you.